Today I'm interviewing Meg Bolger. Meg is a fantastic facilitator based on the East Coast of America. She's known in the facilitator world for her cards, the facilitation cards. She is all over Instagram with her short reels explaining to us how we can create connection, how we bring people into great conversations, how we deal with conflict. In our conversation today, we talk about working with a sibling. We talk about a business breakup she's experienced in the past. Um, having a neurodivergent diagnosis, the different systems that she uses in her business. So grab a cuppa, settle down and enjoy this episode. Hello. How are you? I'm good. So for our listeners, where in the world are you? <laughs> I'm in Montpelier, Vermont. Uh, which is in the U.S. It's the smallest state capital in the country. It's a town of 7,500 people. And uh, yeah, it's in picturesque Vermont. Cute. And have you guys, has your winter started yet? Because this is being all We got two snows. No snow is, uh, the mountains have snow. Uh, the mountain that I, I snowboard at is opening this weekend. Uh, I probably won't go this weekend, but yeah, it started. It has. Uh, Meg and I both have a love of mountains. That's how one of, one of the many topics that we often discuss and talk about. Um, Meg, how do you describe what, what it is you do in the world? Um, I think I mostly say that I teach people how to facilitate and mm -hmm. that I spend a lot of time, uh, yeah, working with other like professional facilitators to learn a thing that is often seen as like a nebulous and kind of... Uh, unclear skill and I try to distill that and then I also sell a product called facilitator cards which goes along with that teaching facilitation but yeah I do social justice training and education was like the world that I came from for a long time I still do some of that work but mostly I train other people how to have challenging conversations or how to facilitate more broadly and that's one of the reasons I think we uh, connected as well I heard you on another podcast with uh, Miriam Hadness and I I don't know if other people do this when they're listening to podcasts, they sort of start to go nod along and have an inner monologue themselves. And I knew I needed to reach out and have a chat. So I think we've been chatting for the last couple of years now. So I'm really grateful that you're here today. Mm -hmm. um, how long have you been running your business? I've been self-employed since 2015. Um, I would say like, well, I don't know if I would call myself self-employed anymore, like because I now employ someone else. Um, but yeah, so I was self-employed from 2015 onward. And um, two years ago, I hired a, I hired my sister um, for the first time. It was the first time I've ever hired somebody. And now I very much feel much more like a business owner than an entrepreneur or like than a solopreneur, which I was for a number of years. But yeah, so that's eight, eight years now. Amazing. So what's the difference, do you think, from when, like, before sister and after Being sister? responsible for someone else's paycheck is a, it's a, it's such a different responsibility. And, like, um, not when I make money, I don't – it's not my money. It's the business's money now. And, like, the money gets, you know – divvied up in different ways. It really feels like, yeah, like in the past, I was just like, I need to make X amount of money per month in order to pay my bills. And now I'm like, the overhead feeling is very, very different. And also like, um, in the past, the only person I impacted was myself. Like I was like, oh, we had a lean month, bummer, you know, but now it's like, nope, that is far scarier when you are responsible for somebody else's um, paychecks. Um, how, how did you know you needed to hire someone? Like what was that decision? I mean, I'm an incredibly collaborative person and it was, I, I was just like really, really struggling to get the amount of projects and work that I wanted to get done in the world out. And it was at the end of the pandemic and it just kind of aligned where um, I needed help and my sister had more time than, uh, and had had time to do it. And so we like piloted it for just like a month. We were just like, let's just try it for a month. And then it was the most productive month you know, in the history of my business. And I was just like, no, we have to keep doing that. And then we just kept, you know, it wasn't like a thing that we were both like fully committed to for a number of months, but um, yeah, it was, it was kind of a confluence of like, I need help. And um, I like finally had a little bit more money to make it happen. 
And I was going to ask, what kind of help was it that you were seeking? Because some people are really curious, like, what's the first hire into their business? Oh, I mean, this was not a strategic thing in the first, like the first hire question. You know, I think uh, so many people are like, what's the first thing that you would outsource? You know, and like I had already outsourced, you know, doing my taxes. I had outsourced like financial advisement and it just in the sense that like somebody to be like, this is how you do a rolling PL, this is how you do, you know, a budget. Um, that kind of thing I had already done a little bit of. I had worked with a, a business coach um for a number of years. So like those were the like first strategic hires that I had. But um in terms of like somebody working with me full time, I mean the first few months was really just me like having somebody else to talk to about the business all the time and then being able to, I mean, I called, I called her my second brain for a while. Cause it was just like finally having somebody to like converse with. Um, so yeah, it wasn't what people think of as like, Oh, I'm going to hire a copywriter or I'm going to hire a finance person, or I'm going to hire like somebody who manages like the books. Like this was an entirely other arena of like collaborative. Um, yeah. Thinking partner. Amazing. I love that because uh, uh, to your point, my brain definitely goes to that sort of first hire mentality of, oh, is it someone to do the finances? Is it a copywriter? Is it someone in social media? Is it someone to dot, dot, dot? But I love the fact that it's just a collaborator, someone that you can have a conversation with that can help sort out the thoughts that are going on around your head. Um, another question I have is, how is it to work with a member of your own family? Oh, I mean, that's a, I, I think it's an incredibly special relationship. Um, but I also like, this would not be the same if I worked with my brother, you know, like it would be a fundamentally different thing. So I don't even know if it's like a member of my family versus just like me and my sister have a really unique working relationship. And um, I mean, she's one of the smartest, funniest people I know. So it's, it's really wonderful. And I get to mess up being a boss with somebody who I have like a relationship that is never going to, uh, be at risk, you know, like I could like impact it. I could like negatively impact it, but, um, but there's, there's something that I get to, I get to like learn with somebody who really cares about me about this entirely new role of like being a boss. And, uh, yeah, that's been a real gift. And I, cause I've worked with some businesses before where they're family members who run the business and it's always an interesting dynamic when it's family owned businesses how how clear do you have to be with one another when you're in this is work mode versus family time or family mode are you explicit yeah i mean i think we're both uh we're both able to like go off on rants pretty easily or like end up talking about our personal lives or you know and so we've had to figure out how to do that enough outside of work that we don't have to do it at work if we don't keep up with each other outside of work enough then it will creep in um, but yeah, it's been a learning process and it's also just like a personality thing where like one of us is going through a tough time. Like we actually can't ask, how are you at the beginning of the day? Cause if we do, then it's like, we're just kind of off on that in that place. So we'll like check in, we'll like message each other on Slack sometimes before we get on zoom just to be like, Hey, like where are we at? What kind of check-in amount do you want to do today? Because, um, yeah, it can be, it can be really good to like set that before you see somebody. I like that even that doesn't matter with your family or not that sounds like a really sensible thing to do mm -hmm. yeah have, have you always done that as a process um, no no it's, an, it's a new it's a new practice even just for us um but yeah I do think it's a I think it's great to because when you get on you're you're already reacting to somebody right you're already being able to like be very responsive to them and so being able to have that kind of pre-established before you get on like what type of energy are you bringing in what type of energy are you like ready to receive yeah that intentionality is really beautiful and how has it helped do you think in different contexts different situations yeah. I mean, I think it's helped. It, it it just helps us like stay focused when we want to focus and it allows us to like, um, not feel like something's coming up that we can't, um, uh, that we can't put back down. Like we, we just, yeah, nice. feel more centered. I'm really curious now to hear more about maybe what other processes or ways of working you have in your business that you use because they might be useful for others to, yeah. To hear. Um, 
Yeah. I mean, I'm somebody who uh, has constantly kind of changed my like to-do list systems and my productivity and my tracking and all those things. It, I spent a lot of time doing all of the different, you know, like I've used probably half of the software that everybody like you, I've used Asana, I've used Todoist, I've used, you know, all those things. At this point I use, there's an app called Notion, which is this incredibly flexible. It's like kind of annoyingly difficult to describe, but it's like this incredibly flexible um, kind of blank canvas that feels like you can organize uh, things in different ways. So on Notion, I have a week page. Uh, and on that week, it says like the things that, you know, we're focused on for that week. It has links to all the different kind of like more specific pages we're referencing. Each day has a drop down of like the things we're doing together, the things that both of us are individually kind of like looking at or, or working on, the yoga and the meditation that we do every day to start. Uh, and then it has our monthly goals in like a screenshot at the bottom of that. And at the, uh, on Fridays on our, on our good days or on Fridays <clears throat> when we're on our, our systems, we do something called the crushed it list. So we say all the things we crushed that week, uh, -huh. uh and we make a list of them and then we write down any like learnings that we had from that week. Uh, and, um, and then we create, you know, a new page of that every, um, every week and then every month we do a review of of those kind of do like a roll up of yeah. what we learned that month amazing wow that is organized i say that from someone who does not operate like that how how do you um get to your goals how, where did they start life i don't i mean i've kind of like an endless idea machine you know like i um I, I don't know, every once in a while in our business, uh, we, we call it like, like last February, we were like, no new ideas, no new ideas, February, we are just trying to execute and get things out the door that are already um, thoughts. But like, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm a quite ambitious person and like coming up with goals. I've never been like, Oh, I need more motivation. And I need more, um, you know, ideas here. I've always just been like, I need more time and I need more focus, but like coming up with ideas and goals. I have no shortage. I mean, yeah, I have no shortage of goals. And and in a, how do you set your goals? Do you set them for a year, a quarter? How does that work? Uh, they're pretty, I like, honestly, I think they're pretty emergent. Like I can remember the first time I was like, oh, this is a goal that I have. Um, and that's going to take like a number of years. Um, but more often than not, it's like, uh, yeah, it's much more specific, short term, um, things but like yeah like facilitator cards i mean we wanted to like overhaul the cards and that took six months you know to to like redo and i really want to write a book about the cards like expanding on each of the processes and like to do that is probably going to take two plus years you know and so like those types of goals yeah sort of emerge in that way but in terms of like the shorter term goals i mean they kind of change almost every month like um, or like, I can have an idea. I can feel really excited about it. I can start working on it and go, Oh, never mind. I don't, you know, like actually that one isn't, it isn't holding my attention. Um, and something you shared and you're happy you said to talk about it as well is just the neurodivergent diagnos diagnostic diagnosis, diagnosis in, sure. in the recent, in the recent past that does that play into this? Does, like, I love that. No, no new ideas. February is almost like brain. I need a break. Like, mm -hmm. <laughs> just give me time to execute. Like, yeah, it sounds like a superpower though as well. Sure. I mean, I think that you know, other people that I talk to who aren't self-employed or had never have been are kind of like, I don't know if I could like stay focused and motivated, you know, without having external pressure from like a boss. And I was just like, oh yeah, that's just like never been my problem. Like that's just never been an issue. And like, that's, you know, that's fair enough that I, I think it's really good for people to know that about themselves. Um, and I think they're right. You know, when, when people are like, I don't know if I could do that. I'm like, you're probably right about that. You know, like it's, it's, it's a very particular flavor of, um, of, of desire or want. Um, I don't know how my neurodivergence, my like ADHD or dyslexia plays into goal setting. I mean, ADHD, maybe, um, I think we're still really barely understanding what ADHD like looks like, particularly in women. Um, because so much of that uh, research has been focused on like young boys, but like, 
Um, yeah, I mean, I have no problem coming up with new things that excite me all the time. And the, the focus and attention and longevity thing is the, is much more of a struggle. And so, yeah. And I think like, um, uh, that also could just be part of being a creative. Like there's a, uh, book that I was listening to. I wasn't listening to the book. I was listening to an interview with Rick Rubin who wrote the book. Um, I can't remember what it's called now. Something about creativity. It just came out. Um, he's a really famous record producer or a music producer. Um, and, uh, he was just talking about like the cycle of creativity, you know, that like, there's like the time of discovery, there's the time of like ideation. And then there's the time of like execution and like re reducing things down and like getting really focused. And like, some people are really good at the different parts of that cycle. And, um, to me, the part that feels very easy is the, you know, generation part and the part that feels like it's still something I'm working very hard to get better at is the like not just getting to like 50, like zero to 50, like starting a project, no problem. Like 50 to 90 is like, okay. But the like 90 to a hundred is like really difficult for me. Is that the ending piece? Like finishing? Yeah. yeah I'm rubbish. Yeah. As well. I'm, it yeah. just, it doesn't excite me. Yeah. Yeah. I think you really have to, um, put a lot of, for me, I have to put a lot of systems in place. I have to put deadlines. I have to bring in external factors. Like I can't, I, I cannot do 90 to 100 by myself. And, and, and I think that's one of the things I've learned running the business. You don't have to do it by yourself. Mm. I think you do. We do need to know, though, that we need to ask for that help mm -hmm. and not to ignore it. Otherwise, I have open ended projects or things don't yep. get closed off. Yep. And that causes I, problems. I think that one of the things that I've learned the most or, or that I'm still learning, but it feels like a really, like a revelatory idea is that you can ask for help much earlier in the process. Like some people are like, well, once I know what I need help on, then I'll ask for help. And I'm like, no, no, no. That's also a part you get to ask for help on. Like if you're like, I'm stuck and I don't know why you can start asking for help. Then you don't have to know why you're stuck in order to ask for help. And I think that, um, yeah, I think that really changes. Um, can can you share an example of how that's worked for you? Um, I mean, I think it could be as simple as like my office, like I moved into a new office in the last year and like, I, I did not know how to like hang up the whiteboards in my office. Like I got a really heavy whiteboard and I was like, how do you do this? How do you mount this thing? Like, how do you put up curtains on this particular structure? And I just had no idea. And I just got stuck for months. And so I finally like asked a friend and I said, I don't know what I need help with other than like, you have to come over and look at it with me and then we'll go to the hardware store together and then we'll come back and do it. But like, I just wanted to be able to be like, I went to the hardware store and now I just need help with this part, but I, I didn't know what it needed. So, yeah. And, and yeah. we don't know what we don't know sometimes. And that's yeah. okay. And, and I think, you know, working for yourself um, can be, because you do have to wear so many hats because you have to be somebody who is able to be really flexible and like constantly learning. I think you can forget how, how often other people, like how often people need help. And so, you know, like I was telling somebody about, you know, the project that me and my friend did to like get the whiteboards up and they're like, Oh, I would have never gotten that done by myself. And I was like, Oh, it's not just a me thing. It's like, just like a universally, that's a difficult thing to do thing. And you can forget that when you don't have, you know, coworkers and uh, bosses. I, I absolutely agree. And I go one step further, actually, on something, on certain things as well. Um, I don't have a partner in life at the moment. Yep. And I find uh, sometimes my girlfriends, my male friends, they've got their partners and bingo, yep. things get sorted or done. And I'm like, yeah, I don't have that either. So, and then I forget to ask for help. Because yep. I also wonder, Meg, because we are in service of others quite naturally anyway, we mm. sometimes wear the hat of helper ourselves and forget to ask for help or think, for sure. can I ask for help? Which yeah. can be detrimental. Yep. 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 And I, I do think like, um, it's interesting, but I, I agree. Like I, I don't have a partner right now. And I think that has influenced like that person just always saw me struggle and then was like, okay, like, I don't need to hear about this the fifth day in a row. I'm coming, coming to your office tomorrow. I'm putting up these goddamn whiteboards, you know, but like when you don't have that, 
you don't end up whining to your friends the same way that you whine to a partner. And so like, it just doesn't, it doesn't happen in that same fashion. And so you do have to be much more explicit about the invitation for help. And um, yeah, I think it's, a, it's in certain ways, it's made me much better at knowing like, oh, I can rely on like a multitude of people to, to do this. And it's, uh, yeah, it is, um, it is something that I think changes your kind of orientation to, towards help. On that, so in the structure of your business, like, and it'll be an informal structure, do you have people that you go to for particular subjects or types of conversation? That's interesting. I've been thinking about this and like, I kind of don't. And I think it's for a long time. I, um, like I had a creative business partner for the first eight years of my career. And we did a lot of things together. We didn't do everything we working together, but we did a lot of things together. And so like, he was my go-to for so much of that conversations. And now I think I'm still playing catch up. Like now that we don't work together any longer, like I'm still playing catch up of like, who do I go to with this kind of question or like with this idea? Um, and my sister, I, I now have a new go-to, you know? So like, because she's there, I can, um, I can just default to her. But like Claire isn't a facilitator. I mean, she might be one of the better facilitator minds I know now because she's spent two years thinking about nothing else. And now she's, you know, uh, got her own opinions and things, but she hasn't, you know, spent her career facilitating. And so it's, um, yeah, I'm still kind of like, uh, sometimes I, I don't think to go external and to like bring those questions to other people. So you mentioned you had a creative business partner and mm -hmm. you've shared in the past with me that you've experienced something that not a lot of people have experienced before, but it's a business breakup. I was wondering, what was that like for you? Is it, is it something that not a lot of people have experienced before? Like if, if you have a business partner, like it feels just as likely that people go through breakups with business partners as they do with like romantic partners, um, which means it's very unlikely. Yeah. I don't think we do talk about it. I don't think we do talk about it because I think that it's a really interesting thing where like, I don't know, people also don't talk about their breakups, like their romantic breakups in public that like in, in like public as in writing blogs, you know, I mean, people write entire books about it, but, um, but there is something interesting about doing that when it's in a, like a career or a, a, a field, you know what I mean? And I think that, um, and like, yeah. So um, I think something I'll say is that when we first stopped working together, I was like, why is this so, like, this is a huge deal, you know? And until I started using the word breakup, I don't think that my system was like, I kept being like, why is this such a big deal? Or like, how do I articulate like this kind of loss to people? Um, Cause people would just be like, Oh, that's a bummer. You're not working together anymore. And I'd be like, yeah, it's like a bigger deal than that though. Yeah. And like we, breakup or like divorce was like a much years. better language. Yeah. So there's that you had an eight year, I'm guessing friendship, partnership, workship, situationship. Yeah. yeah. Um, a piece of language I was given from a relationship breakup r romance um because I was just beside myself in 2020 and I've written about this quite a few times on LinkedIn you know leading with grief and my mentor said to me I think you're we, we often grieve the future we thought we were going to have and I wonder mm -hmm. whether that's a that's a truth as well within a business divorce breakup totally could be yeah I don't know if it was uh, in this case for me, but I do think that like, yeah, oh my gosh, in, in, uh, in other areas of life, I think, yeah, that can be even, sometimes you can grieve that more than what you lost is like yeah. the, what could it, what it could have been thing. Um, yeah, I don't think that was true in this case particularly, okay. but I do think it, it, it is something that like, because, uh, I don't know, we segment work and life out that people really don't, uh, we like, I don't, I don't know that to, I'd never heard anybody use the word business breakup, you know, and when I use it, a lot of people are like, huh, interesting. Yeah. That's an interesting thing to like articulate it that way. And I'm like, yeah, it was, you know, and, um, go ahead. Because it's your truth. Like that is something that happened. Like we were together 
working together, going in this way, and then right. we went in separate ways. Yeah, I think it's interesting, like in the same way that, you know, with romantic relationships, when I've left them, you find what are the ways in which that positively shaped you? What are the ways in which it limited you? What are the ways that you like were changing in a direction that you maybe like are now not being pulled in anymore? Yeah. Like there's so many things that happened after that. Like I, you know, there's a lot of things that me and my <clears throat> um my ex-business partner, um, like there are a lot of things that like, we just didn't do. We didn't, we didn't do a lot of like video based projects. We didn't do a lot of, um, we didn't do a lot of interviews. We didn't do a lot of, um, social media, you know, and like all of that was fine, but it was also stuff that I think it was more like, uh, what are we both pretty good at? That's where we, where we stayed, you know, and like certain things that he was really brilliant at, um, and I never explored like, how good am I on video or like, how much do I like making like one minute real videos, you know? And like, the answer is like, I'm very comfortable on video. I'm very happy to, to do that. And we never explored that because it wasn't something that he was into. And like, that was just one of those things where I didn't know I was limiting my, my own creative exploration because of that relationship. Um, just because it was like what we had yeah done and gotten good at yeah and also I guess it's the same with friendships and relationships when you just end up having tacit agreements or unsaid agreements in a relationship things just happen the way they happen and to your point I didn't explore doing you're really good on video I see you all the time on insta and <laughs> it's a natural it's a natural um medium for you like yeah you show up really well and yep. Yep. Engage. And until two years ago, I didn't do almost any of it. Wow. Yeah. Maybe three at this point, but like, yeah, until, until that point, like until I was basically on my own and I was like, huh, how would I put this out there? I was like, well, I think I'm going to write a bunch of videos or I think I'm going to make a bunch of videos. I mean, now I don't even write, I don't, you know, most of the videos that you see like are unscripted and, um, they feel really easy and comfortable, yeah. but like, that wasn't something that I had done. Um, okay. and it's interesting to like, find out like, what are the things that you thought were you and what were the things that were actually the collaboration or the like intersection of your partnership? And, um, when, when given just, you know, your alone time, you're not yeah. doing that anymore. How obvious was it to you now that the divorce was coming? Um, I don't know. You know, it was during the pandemic. So like, I don't know if anything was normal, you know? <laughs> and I think that, uh, there's certain ways it's like, uh, we were, um, growing apart or we were not meeting each other, you know, where we needed to anymore. And, uh, and then there's also ways where it's like, it couldn't have happened like a day sooner than it did. Right. So, um, yeah, I think pandemic warps time in a really like distinct way on that one, or at least I have the excuse of, of the pandemic. Uh, uh, that was, that was it for me as well. If anyone was sitting here listening to you now going, Oh, I'm sensing something. They're in a business partnership and they're sensing something. Mm. What, what advice would you just give them at this time? Yeah. I mean, you know, something that was really helpful for me was that I had a couple of other like little collaborative coll uh, collaborations. Like I had a couple of other people that I like did a, a workshop with, or I, I was doing like a project with and not running like kind of the main part of my business with. And having those was really helpful because um, having those was really helpful as like a reference point of like, hmm. what is me? Uh, what is the things that are just true about me? And what are the things that are true about this relationship that I might be over attributing to me? You know, yeah. like, are you anxious in every partnership? Or is it just the one that you're worried about? Right? Yeah. Or do you find it difficult to like bring up, you know, hard subjects or like get into conflict with everyone? Or is it just that particular partnership, you know, and I think having those reference points was really, really helpful. Um, Cause it allowed me to, to, yeah, like get more clear. And I think if somebody, if you're like wondering, um, yeah, if you're like wondering if it's not a good fit for you anymore, I think it's, it's really scary. I mean, I found that, that, that wondering stage to be like deeply yeah. frightening. Um, and, uh, I talked to everybody about it. I mean, like right. other than that person, you know, which was like hard, but I think, um, I think it's really good to like start being honest with, 
people about how you're feeling. And, um, and this is the way it's like, totally like a breakup. You can't know what the future is after that. Like you have to just trust that, like, um, yeah, that what you're, what you're feeling of like, I don't think this is working is, is true. And then you have to like, really, you know, just relinquish to that and not try to control the outcome. And, and thank you. And, and listening to you share the story, Meg, of, of your experience, it, I can act, I'm drawing parallels in my head to relationships, like romantic yep. relationships. And I'm sitting here wondering whether at any time you were like, oh, maybe it's just better I stay in the relationships. At least I know what I'm in and it's my business and I know how I'm going to earn some money. And then fear takes over because what if I step away or what if we choose to to go in different paths? What's that going to mean? Am I going to be able to survive? Like, at a yeah, fundamental I level? mean, I think that's. That's an interesting, like, I think in the same way that like, you know, when people who are in long-term partnerships, like you have a house, you have, I mean, could have kids, you have cats together, like, you know, like whatever it is, like all of those are things that you're like, oh, this is going to be so annoying, you know, like, and, and difficult and like time consuming and challenging to like de detangle, you know? And I think, um, yeah, the more that I, I'm, I'm sharing about it, the more I'm like, it's exactly like a breakup. Like it, it's exactly like a breakup where you're just like, you know, the, all of the same questionings that you go through all the same calculations, except like there's this layer where instead of perhaps like romantic feelings of connection, there is this like real financial entanglement, or there's this real, you know, career entanglement, you know, for, I don't, I don't think this was true for me, but there are people who it's like, they don't know you outside of that partnership, right? Like for some people, their business partnerships are so, um, like they might be like a unit that people experience as a unit. And you're like, I don't even know who I am outside of those or like career wise. I don't know who but I that am. But that happens in romantic relationships. Have you not got that yes. with some of your friends? Yes, we like... call it codependency. <laughs> <laughs> but they get, you get, you get named in the same sentence. Yes, It'd totally. Be... Uh, at school, I dated a guy for three years. Will it'd be Kirsty and Will? Kirsty and Will. Yeah, like it was never Will. Yeah, like people don't know or your Kirstie. last name; they know you as yeah. like that per. You know, yeah, that person's partner. That person's partner. Yeah, wow. for sure. It's exactly like that. And I just think that like um, it's so funny to me the different areas of our life where we are like we like compartmentalize the things that we've learned or the or the or the experiences like. I don't know. I use a, I do a lot of, I did for a long time, like a lot of like social justice and diversity education and these things that people know about like how to give people feedback. They just forget in like, they're like, how do I give, you know, like my boss feedback around being racist. And I'm like, well, how would you give them feedback around anything else? And they're like, I don't know. And I'm like, okay, well, like maybe we should start with an easier thing to give them feedback around. And like, think about like what works then and what are the things you would do and like how would you approach it and they're like oh that's a good idea and I'm like yeah because it's not different it's just like a it's just like a, a different level there's like a, additional factors to it and like this feels like that where it's like I don't know if you were ending any type of relationship or you were deciding to like move on or that this isn't working for you anymore like what are all the processes you would go through you would go through like questioning and frustration and anger and talking to your friends and you know all these things and it's like yeah do that you know it's the same it's it it isn't it does not need to be treated as fundamentally differently than um it just has additional layers like it does need to in the sense that you are probably going to have to have a conversation that isn't true in a breakup of like how much of the business do i owe you for how long you yes. know um, um but like it's just more it's not different let's just play a game Let's fast forward you and the opportunity to have a new business partner happens. Mm. And imagine you're, it's a positive sensation. You're not sitting there. You've worked through, I'm sure there'd be some conversations to be had. What sort of things would you look at next time? Like, you know, going in eyes wide open this time, I'm imagining you'd be like boundaried up to the hilt. The parameters <laughs> are in play. And I'm, I just wanted to help other people. Like what, two or three things that you'd now go in and go, right, I'd want a conversation about this topic and this topic and this topic. It's just like dating though, right? Like where, like, it's just, you're, you're a different person. You know, you are changed by every relationship. I mean, I was 23 when I started my business partnership, you know, previously, and now I'm almost 35. So like, 
I will like I I am like also a fundamentally different person. Um, but yeah, I mean, I could I I can definitely answer some of those questions because I I had it wasn't exactly like a big business partnership, but it was this like collaboration that came online last summer. And um, yeah, I was very clear about certain things. Um, I wanted to feel like it was really important to me to feel like my I I wanted to make sure that I felt um, really like, uh, va valued and like, but also like I was bringing a unique value and that like, I felt that way even more than they did. Like, I, I think a lot of times, like there was just an en enormous amount of self, uh, judgment in my, in my past working relationship. And like a lot of that got projected onto him and it wasn't coming from him. It was coming from me, you know? And so like the level of confidence that I wanted to feel in myself in new um, collaborations was really important. Um, I think the ability to feel like what I was good at, the things that I am naturally good at were a, a good and aligned fit that I wasn't wishing I was somebody else, you know, like in the past, like my ex was an incredible, um, uh, writer and an incredible like coder. Like he like m would code websites from scratch. And I was always like, that's amazing. I can't contribute to this at all, you know? And, um, and that made me feel really, yeah, like self-conscious and like I was lacking something. And so in like the future partnerships, like I don't, if we have different skills, they need to feel like complimentary. They don't, I don't want them to activate this like part of me that feels really insecure. Um, uh, so that felt important. That's, and those are not the places I thought you'd go. Thank you. No. Because my brain was like, do you have conversations really clearly about the finances? Do you talk about who does what well and therefore take different responsibilities? Yeah. I mean, some of that, I think, would, to be fair, like some of that is also true. Like we had no contracts. In I was going to say, uh, would you do something no. more formal in the future? Yeah, it depends though. I, some of it, like I kind of love that we didn't because to me it, it indicated a level of like trust and respect that felt really safe and comfortable and like genuinely was true. Um, but also like it's very, it's very like it was great to have very explicit conversations about money. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, but like I don't feel like it's an armor thing. It's more just like a allows me to put things down just like yeah i want to nice. constantly be like this doesn't need to take up brain space yeah you know? yeah amazing so what does the future hold now for for your, your business for you facilitate cards what's what's on the idea board i mean every six months we reinvent this business like uh like it really like two years ago at this time i was running mostly free workshops and trying to make the business basically sustainable on facilitator card sales alone. And that wasn't possible. Like, especially once, uh, <laughs> when Apple didn't update and stopped scraping all of your data for Facebook and Instagram ads, they got a lot less effective, um, which is like great, uh, but also terrible, it, like business wise, but like privacy wise, great. So we're going to call it great. Um, but yeah, like in the last few years, like I've shifted from like being a card centric sales business to like card and trainings, but all private trainings to like this quarter, it was mostly public trainings that people could sign up for. And that was like the majority of our, um, our, of our business. And that's the first time that's ever been true. Um, yeah. Um, and like, I have no idea. I mean, like I kind of have, I have hopes, but I have like no idea. Like it's possible we could get one contract next year that like might take up most of the year. And that would be a fundamentally different kind of business than I've ever run before. Um, I'm used to being like a one-off drop in, run a training and go facilitator and not like a big consultant, um, space, uh, you know, evaluation, all of those things. I've never done that, but I think it's very possible that that could be hmm. what 2024 will look like. Um, I love that. Yeah. I like, but yeah. I, Go ahead. I like what you said. Um, you know, we're, we're a different business to what we were six, six months ago. And, and something we shared when we were chatting about this and it really made me chuckle, which was the, I'm hitting the, I am crap wall every six months. And it just, it's something I could just relate to. Yeah. What does that mean for you? 
I will say, I think I'm finally, uh, I don't hit it as aggressive. Well, actually, maybe it's just shifted from like I used to. So, you know, when I started facilitating full time, um, yeah, like every six months, I would hit this place of just like, I cannot believe anyone hired me six months ago. I was so bad. I knew so much less than I did. I did not have the like understanding. I hadn't unpacked these concepts. Like I cannot believe somebody paid me to do that. And then I would have that again six months later. And I'd be like, oh, like, and it was a really like kind of painful growing process because it, it, I knew, you know, everybody wants a therapist with 20 years experience. Everyone wants a surgeon with 20 years experience, but like, there's only one way to get there, you know, which is like, you have to be the surgeon with like six months experience, you know? And so, um, yeah, like that just became, I, after a couple of years of that, I was like, this is just what it is. This is just a normal part of the process. This actually means that you care and like all of these things. Um, but yeah, that was the wall, uh, was like around my actual like work and facilitation was like, I did not, I felt like I was so much better six months later. And therefore I felt like it was horrible what I had been doing six months before. So I think that's really, I love the fact that you care so much that you look backwards and almost go, oh my goodness me, I can't believe, um, I did that. My brain goes the other way, which is wow, the universe gifts us the projects that it knows we're ready to handle. And mm. so what's happened for me in different parts of the business cycle and growth, sometimes like some projects land on my doorstep, some global projects, or there was one where I needed, they asked me to help them find Vietnamese speaking sales trainers, Thai speaking sales trainers, you know, really specific. And I was like, okay and I was just like I can do that and I did and I fulfilled all the briefs we did loads of train the trainers it was an amazing experience part of me could have gone no that's that's a bonkers thing that you want me to do how do you even think that I can cope with that but a small part of me went yeah but someone's seeing something that you might not see right now so go for it follow the breadcrumbs and you can do 80% of this project. There's just some mm -hmm. nuances that you're being invited to learn about that you're going to do in this particular project. And that reframe for me has helped me to say yes to more projects that I would potentially sort of be more cautious on and have gone, oh, well, mm. or I would have said yes, but then run off to get somebody else involved mm. and probably didn't need to, you know, learn to trust myself more. Yeah. 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 I think now I don't have it around facilitation, like the actual practice of it. I'm like, no, I'm very good at that. And I feel very comfortable with that, but I have it around business where I'm just like, Oh, I'm such an amateur. Like, I can't believe, you know, six months ago, like, what was I thinking? What was I doing? And now, because I've done that cycle so many times, I am much more like self-forgiving. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think it is really interesting that, uh, I don't know, like, <clears throat> video games do this perfectly. They, they meet where you are, your skill level is, and then they create like just a little bit of skill gap. Right. And so like, that's why so many people get really into video games is that it's constantly leveling you up. Like, it's like, we know you're here. We know that you could be here and you have the skills to do that. And we're going to create like just a little bit of challenge every time. Right. It's not impossible. Like this isn't impossible by any means, but like, it's just enough. It's just enough challenge. And I think like in business, that's a really interesting thing is like, sometimes you are given proposals that you're like, no, no, that one's too much. That's, that's actually like an enormous gap and it would be kind of inappropriate for you to take it on or like um or just like it's not right for you I don't I don't know it's very clear to me when people are like oh my god this is an amazing idea and I'm like yeah it is an amazing idea so go find somebody else like you know uh uh have you ever read Big Magic by Elizabeth Gilbert no I haven't I've read her other books great go on. great book um yeah, very different than her other books. So uh, Big Magic is a book, the subtitle is Creative Living Beyond Fear. And um, she talks about ideas in a way that, uh, like, at least this is where I learned it is from her talking about ideas. And she talks about ideas as just like things that are floating around in the universe, like looking to be born. Like they're just looking for somebody to like make them real, you know? And so like you'll hit an idea and, uh, or an idea will hit you and it'll be like, huh, huh? 
you and like you might be like oh my gosh absolutely i am a hundred percent the right person for this idea um and there's other ones that you're like oh my god no like go find somebody else and like the practice you know she talks about like some of us hold on to ideas that aren't ours and like we what we want to do is like yeah hold on to the ideas that are ours and show up for them like and if you don't show up for an idea long enough it will move on it will oh, yeah. it'll leave you and it will go find somebody else i love that mm -hmm. i like um the piece about the video games as well and create they create a skill gap in you but then they encourage you yeah. to to step up and to move and, and i genuinely think that happens for us in our businesses as well and we get a new project a particular type of client a new situation that you're working with an associate that you've never done before um a new piece of content that needs creating and i just think every project every every opportunity brings something new and possible or just a stretch not necessarily brand new but a stretch and just to notice that and then even like look back on yourself for the last two years and go wow what have i look what i have achieved because yeah. i think that's another thing working on our own even there's there's yourself and your sister now which is great you do the crush it list on a friday it's so easy to forget to go and celebrate like what you've achieved and yep. how much things have changed, evolved and grown and how different we are from the person we were two years ago, five years ago, seven years ago. Yeah. I think um, something that is a really concrete practice that I, I continue to like try to get better at is you know, we do the, yeah, crushed it list on Fridays for the week, but then every month we do a monthly review. And what that requires to do is to actually set a bunch of goals at the beginning of the month. Like we have a mural board and we have these like columns of like, okay, what is all the admin goals? What's all like, if there's major projects, you know, like what's the, the goals for, you know, we're releasing a, a ver version three of facilitator cards in, I don't know, six months, you know, like, where's that goal? Where's this one progressing? And you have to set all of that at the beginning of the month. So that at the end of the month, you can go look at it, look, we did it. Like, and you like check it all off. And if you don't set specific goals, you actually don't get to celebrate them. Because like, I didn't set a specific goal for my, like, um, my, like, series, uh, the like facilitating for the future series that I, I ran this fall. And so like, I think it was successful, but if I had at the beginning of the, uh, of the beginning of the quarter been like, I want to sell this many tickets. I want to have this much income. I want to get this many reviews. Then I would have been able to be like, Oh, I did it. You know, I nailed it. And, and instead I was just like, I think it was good. Like it, it brought in the money we needed it, you know, like, but I didn't write down the goals and then have a time to go check in on them. And like, that might feel silly, but like, it is, I think an incredibly important part of feeling satisfied in your business. Like the question of like, what allows you to feel satisfied, I think is um, that's actually like a question we ask in our monthly review is like what helped with focus and like what allowed you to feel like we did a good job. And like, even just knowing like what, what allows you to do a good feel like you did a good job. Like I send out evaluations, not because I mostly use them, I don't, I'm not particularly good at posting testimonials. I don't tend to change a lot from, you know, people aren't tend to, don't tend to give me like a lot of specific critical feedback. It is simply so I can feel like, wow, I did a good job. And, and that's actually worth doing, you know, like it's, it's worth having those ways in which you congratulate yourself because nobody else is doing it for you. And you actually do need to like integrate the, mm, the successes. I love that. So Meg, we're coming towards the end of our conversation and we could carry on quite easily. I get that. So we have a, some quick fire questions that I'd okay. love to ask you. Uh, what advice would you give to someone starting out in a training or facilitation business? Um, I would say run things for free that you want to get paid for and always get everyone's email. Great. Who do you follow in social media land that you think others should too? Um, social media. Um, I mean, you're very fun to follow. Um, I, the, <laughs> like, honestly, like social media is getting to a place where uh, you don't even follow specific people. The algorithm mm -hmm. just like tells you things. Um, I don't know. I like therapy Jeff a lot. Uh, 
I and, do too. Um, the, that's I don't know. Therapy Jeff wins in this rapid fire because I Let's can't do think that. of other people off the top of my head. That's okay. <laughs> uh, any book recommendations, podcast recommendations that you like? Oh man, I always have a million podcast recommendations. Um, like genuinely, I, I listen to like four to eight hours of podcasts a, a week probably and have for like probably close to a decade. Um, yeah, so I mean like the podcasts that I most regularly keep up with are We Can Do Hard Things uh, with Glennon Doyle, Abby Wambach and um, Amanda Doyle, I think. Um, we Can Do Hard Things. Uh, listen to the Dr. Becky episodes on We Can Do Hard Things. So okay. I'm just going to like randomly pull out one. Um, on Being with Krista Tippett is another interview podcast. Uh, there was a pod, there was one recently called um, The Body's Grace, which was super beautiful. And um, if you've never heard Ocean Vong, uh, who's a poet, um, <clears throat> everything he says is incredible. He is a okay. full on sage and... Um, absolutely worth listening to. Um, yeah. I mean, there's like so many, um, so there's so many episodes. Like I love Ruby sales episode of on being, I love John Lewis's. I love Amanda Ripley talking about, um, high conflict. Those three are really great. If you do any conflict resolution work, um, those are really, really beautiful. Um, book recommendations. Yeah. I barely get through books. I mean, like in terms of like facilitation, uh, if you've never read Teaching to Transgress by Bell Hooks, no. it's, uh, it's education as a practice of freedom. And okay. uh, yeah, it's just like kind of a beautiful book on, um, yeah, the practice of education. If you if you identify as an educator, you should read that. Okay. Um, I'm looking at my bookshelf. Uh, yeah. I mean, I wrote a book called yeah. Unlocking the Magic of Facilitation. Um, so that's great. And I'm also working on a podcast, uh, that's not about facilitation, but is about more like social justice activism, um, uh, called lucid, the radical generosity podcast. Brilliant. Um, and we will put and... the links to that Meg and your book in the show notes. Absolutely. Um, and make sure people yeah. can come and find you. And where is the best place for people to find you in social media land? Um, if yeah, for, allows. At facilitator cards on Instagram um, and Meg Bolger on LinkedIn are probably the two and YouTube facilitator cards on YouTube. Um, those are the three places for sure to keep up. We also have facilitator cards LinkedIn, but we post both on my personal and um, yeah. Instagram for short form content, YouTube for longer content, LinkedIn for questions and conversation about facilitation. Awesome. Meg, thank you so much for being my guest today. I've thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed our conversation. Um, go well and speak to you again soon. All right. Thanks for having me. 